evening and welcome to this week's Vox number nine. I cannot believe that we're already halfway through our first ever season of Vox Talks delivered by inspirational alumni from Hot House. It's been an amazing journey and the rest of this season is looking as equally interesting. Tonight's guests include the wonderfully talented Miss Lauren Hogg, who's one of our very, very first alumni. And we're going to follow that on with a super young chap by the name of Jack Drink, who's going to be dialing in uh, from North America, Canada. So we hope you have a really good time and that you enjoy what you're about to hear. Just a quick reminder to all the people who are tuned in today. The purpose of these talks is really to show our current students and their parents why hot house education is important and how hot house education can help them you know in any sort of career it's not just a music career i know we have a sensational amount of alumni that go on to world class music degrees and world class music careers but actually we're just as proud of those that go on to change the world doing other things and if you think we've got out of every 100 students that we have 97 of those don't go into music. 97 of those go into doing lots of other things. Might be the um, general counsel for the International Paralympic Committee. It might be the sales director for the whole of North America. So we're super proud of our alumni and we hope that uh, mums and dads appreciate these little chats to show you what sort of careers that you can go into. A few session guidelines, just like always. If you would like to ask a question, please, please write this down in the chat box and my glamorous assistant, otherwise known as Stu, We'll be monitoring these today to make sure that they go through to Lauren at the right time. And the more questions, the better. Also, if you can stay on silent, that would be really nice because we try not to disturb the flow for the evening. And hopefully at the end of the session, if there's anything that we've missed, Lauren and Jack, they won't mind if you send them a quick, compliment, a quick email to ask them what um, a particular question. I'll just let the next guy in. This is Neil joining us from Swansea. Right over to today's star guest for Vox number nine. This is Lauren Hogg. Lauren, I'm delighted to say, came from a little town just up the road from Derby called Ripley. <laughs> or rather, she managed to escape a town up the road called Ripley. For all those people, Ripley is a lovely place. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And it's actually created some ridiculously talented musicians. And since she was playing in the band when it was originally known as Emmy Jo, she's gone on to a stellar career with the Conservatoire of Music in Birmingham. And she's now based somewhere down in the south of London. So good evening, Lauren. Hello, thank you for having me. No, it's really Hi, great to be here. So we'd love to start these chats off with a little bit of a background of your journey. You know, what you did at school, maybe, a bit of college, mm -hmm. a bit of your careers. If you could bring people into the know, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, went to school in Ripley and did quite a lot of extracurricular music stuff, actually. As you mentioned, Emmy Jo, played in County Band, did Music Centre, and then went off to Conservatoire for four years there. Um, and when I left, was doing a bit of playing and teaching, and I ended up going to do a Master's in Music Psychology, uh, which was really interesting, kind of quite an open course. You kind of did a little bit of everything and then picked your specialism. Um, and the thing that I was really interested in is how musicians communicate. And so I actually went started a PhD, which I didn't finish. Um, I ended up once, as soon as I started the PhD, I actually started working for a company that does coaching and realized that that was actually what I wanted to do. So I did for a few years kind of working, teaching and doing the PhD, but in the end I realized it wasn't for me. And it's kind of, it's weird to say, oh, I kind of walked away from something so big, but actually having realized coaching is what I want to do, it was the right decision. I learned a lot. Um, and now I work for a coaching company, um, working as a coach and working with lots of different people, uh, businesses, individuals, whole organisations, different teams. So, yeah, it's really exciting. It's good, isn't it? And actually, I'm glad to know that you're not the only person who hasn't finished the PhD because I was supposed to be doing one in York as well. Kind of never finished it and never got there. So, you know, I, I'm sure I've learned yeah. from the journey as much as I have anything else. I'm going to take you back a little bit to when you were at school, when it was um, Ripley Mill Hill. Um, and you were doing music, do you have any idea that you were going to go into coaching or, you know, psychology back even then when you were doing your A-levels? I did psychology as an A-level actually and I was 
I was really interested in it and at the time you could apply to music colleges and universities separately so I actually applied to do psychology at university and then on results day kind of had the choice of what to do and decided to go with the music and it actually it wasn't until my fourth year at college uh, instead of second study there was an option to have some coaching sessions and I met an amazing coach called Karen O'Connor and I had a couple of sessions with her and thought it's kind of felt like it's going I'm a little bit too late in my journey I wish I'd had it earlier but it was the first time I realized oh you can do the music and the psychology together and so that was then when I started looking around for how could I do that what could I do with that and actually where I've ended up now they're primarily business focused but I've been having conversations with them about carving out a bit of time away from there so that I can go back and start working with musicians because I think there is there is space I think for for that to be a thing and I think a lot of the colleges now are taking mental health and coaching more seriously as a provision for their students, which is amazing. But yeah, I think it was, I've always been interested in that kind of psychological side of things. I just, I didn't know at the time that you could put them together. Um, and, and perhaps, I, I'm not sure actually how many courses there would have been had I wanted to do that then. I'm not sure it would have been an option. No, but it, it's amazing to think that, um, you know, we talk about mental health and well-being with all the young children nowadays, and it just didn't exist when we were, you know, we were growing up and we were doing music back then, it just was completely alien. And I'm sure there were music psychologists that were happening, but it wasn't those things. Did you feel that the psychology that you were doing at A-level was helping you get into the conservatoire and vice versa? Were they complementary subjects at the time? I think, I'm not sure they were connected in any particular way in terms of we weren't looking at music in the psychology was it was quite broad you were looking at the fundamentals of the subject but I think there's something about being aware of your mindset and the way that you think and how all of that can influence how you are that again as you say you know that wasn't necessarily there in the same way it is now um, I think it, it was it was just something that I was really interested in and I found really fascinating you thinking about how people think and how they behave and how that comes from different places and different experiences that we have so just something that's really fascinating. Yeah, and I, you know, I think we, as we've grown, as well as a company, we are more aware now of the, how different people approach different subjects and how being aware of other people's learning skills make it such a big difference to ourselves as well. We've got a very good friend, Andrew Deaton, who does a lot of um, business coaching around our area, who does a lot of work about characters and the way that, you know, you bring your learning style and how you can work with each other's teams. And it's, it's been super useful. When you were going through the conservatoire, was that a good experience for you? Did you enjoy your time there? Was it the classical course you did? Yeah, I did the classical one. So it was a bit broader than if you specialise in something like the jazz course. And I think, I think actually looking back on it now and the things that I found tough about that, actually, I think was to do with me and my mindset. And, you know, I kind of got to a certain point and then I think it was my own mind getting in my way of me accelerating my playing and so it wasn't that I couldn't play it was that I didn't think I could play as well as I wanted to and that whole mental process got in the way of me doing what I wanted to do so now that's why I look back and I think it would have been really helpful if there had been people who could understand that or explain that to me in that in that kind of way and say actually we just need to look at this bit that's it's not even to do with your playing it's just a little to do with your mindset and how you're thinking that will have such a big impact then and you can go off and play so I think in in hindsight that would be really helpful but as we're saying you know I don't know that that was necessarily there then because no. it was about 15 years ago yeah, no it was not I mean it's <laughs> so, really interesting yeah. because you know the people <laughs> who signed in uh, you know a couple of weeks ago would have heard Rob Spolton saying exactly the same things you know about the mental approach to being at music college uh, and I think it's crucial because I mean, it's four years of your time to have that support yeah. network and the awareness of the lecturers around you to, it's not about just playing the musical instruments, it's about looking after your mental health and how you feel about music. It's super important. And you, I, I remember you were, your fourth year, yeah. your final recital was just sensational and huge. And well, you know, how did you decide to go and do a, a master's in music psychology? Did that happen before the fourth year or? Was there a seminal light bulb moment? I think meeting Karen and having those coaching sessions was what made me realise I could bring the two things together, these two things I was interested in. 
And I think then going off, leaving music college, doing playing and teaching, I think teaching is something that's really valuable to do because if you don't understand something, you can't explain it. So you can't, you really have to know your stuff if you're going to teach it. And so there was something then about thinking, working with young people, how can I explain these things? How can I help my young people stay well? That kind of it's just yeah I wanted to go off and do a bit more exploring and if you you know music psychology is really broad you can I, there, I was with people who were doing neuroscience I was with people who were doing developmental stuff around um, how you how you develop musically and how music can help young people's development people working with children with special educational needs there were, there's a whole variety in response to different tones um memory it's just it's, it's really broad but for me it was about the people that's what i kept coming back to how the people play together and i think that's something that is a skill that you really develop in music is how to work with others how to collaborate that you don't get i mean you might get it to an extent in things like sports but you don't get it in lots of the other academic subjects and a lot of the teachers that i speak to see the, the their students experience of being able to work with others and then they go off to somewhere and they're with the, for example the university they're with people who've never done music and they think wow you know they don't know how to work together or collaborate or listen to each other and I think music can give you all these different skills that you don't necessarily get to the same extent in other places so for me it's I keep coming back to the people and how people work together is just fascinating to me it really is and and, and that you spend your day job doing that now helping people what what is your day job actually like as a coach what is a coach because there'll be some young people out here who've got no concept of what a business coach or a life coach would do what does that involve yeah so where I work is more business coaching focused. So we will work with, d depending on what people need, we'll either work with individuals one-on-one -on -one or with the whole teams, maybe sometimes multiple teams from an organization or sometimes it is a whole organization. And it can be, it, it depends what they want and what they need to focus on. But as an example, it might be bringing a team together. Somebody might have formed a new team and they want to figure out how to work really effectively together. Together. and so we might go in and help them understand their purpose or what their vision is uh, what kind of behaviors that they want to display as a team kind of getting clear on their ways of working together if it's an individual normally the way we work is they will have something they want to work on throughout the program maybe a few goals that they're looking to achieve and we'll support them in achieving that so it's not it's not us coming in and saying I'm an expert in what you do I'm going to tell you what to do in, in that kind of mentoring way it's more about facilitating other people's learning and the, in coaching it's about raising somebody's awareness so that they can make choices more informed choices and take responsibility for what they're doing so our, yeah our day job can be quite varied uh, it depends what what clients we're working with at a time and in particularly in the company where I am now that ranges from anything from oil and gas companies to the NHS to technology companies I'm working with some teachers at the moment so it's a real variety and I think it's something that if you need support uh, thinking things through or achieving your goals coaching can be really helpful uh, it's, it's different to counseling where it would be perhaps more focused on things in your past and thinking about how that's influencing where you are now it's different to mentoring where you go to somebody with a specific experience who you want to learn from it's more about looking forward and what you want to achieve and supporting you to to get there so that's that's my role at the moment and as i say i, I think there is scope in the music world for that and supporting people thinking about their performance and how what what else is happening in their life is is helping them or hindering them getting in the way and i also think for young people as well perhaps starting a bit younger helping people think about the kind of mindsets that they cultivate and how they think about themselves and particularly music about their playing i think it'd be really helpful so got an eye on that as a potential future area to, to go off and explore. I think that's, that's wonderful actually because you know you've said that you know over the next few years you're going to try and build into or carve out a bit of area for music and psychology at your current practice. We've just had a really nice question from Eleanor saying you know do you have any advice from a psychologist's point of view of how to overcome the barrier of starting to play? You know they often really like it once they get started to play you know when, when you were just talking about how to develop good healthy processes procedures mm -hmm. you know from young ages what sort of things would you naturally come to mind mm. I will oh. just to be, cl be clear I don't have a full degree in psychology so I wouldn't say I'm a psychologist so I just want to make that clear uh, I think 
particularly it depends on the age of the person that's learning but particularly with younger students I know there is some evidence to say that actually to start with it's helpful to have support from guardians who are around them people you know helping put structure in place for practicing and things like that and that there will come a tipping point where they they do need to take ownership of it and take responsibility for doing that because otherwise you're kind of pushing them to do it and they need to they need to own that so i think my encouragement would be to start small you know do small chunks of time maybe put some structure in place it might be depending on your own musical skill and experience even if you aren't a trained musician you might be able to sit help up initially particularly if they're very young but I think it's starting small and putting a bit of structure in place can be really helpful but everybody's different and everybody needs different things some people might say actually I want to be totally independent and I just want to do this and some people might need a little bit more help maybe they might, might not know how to ask for the help as well that's another thing yeah, <laughs> but, know, hopefully that's helpful no that is true <laughs> and, you know, from our point of view um, for Eleanor, we think about little and often, and we don't say practice, you know, we, we replace the word practice with play, because, you know, there's so many positive connotations with, oh, I'm just going to play, it's so much fun, I'm going to play, and, you know, a little bit of consistency yeah. doing the same thing every day is really, really good, but, you know, uh, my dad and locked me in, a, in the music room for 30 minutes every day at the end of school, regardless of whether he was in there, my mum was in there, I just to do that but then in, like you say there came a tipping point and we did manage to um i did manage to find my own drive a little bit towards the end <laughs> if we're going to just have a quick look at some some challenges or things that you've overcome and some life lessons that you carry with you i know i've had more than my fair share have, have you got any things that you particularly would like to share i think just think so I think for me, there's something around finding your voice, uh, whatever that means to you. I think, for, and this is just from my personal experience, I think it took me a long time, and it's still something I'm working on, that finding your own things that you want to say, whether that's generally in the world or through your playing, is taking inspiration from people is brilliant, but they're them and you're you. So if you want to take things from other people, brilliant, but how do you integrate that into who you are? So for me, there's something about encouraging young people to find their voice and be able to share their opinions and have debates and discussions about things. I think that's really important because then when you go out into the world, not only can you advocate for yourself, you can advocate for others as well. So that's, that's definitely something that I've been working on cultivating. What else? Um, asking for help, definitely. If you need help, ask for help. Find somebody that feels like an appropriate person that you can go to. I would say definitely take care of your physical, mental and emotional health and well-being. You know, you find something you enjoy to do to move your body. Find people that you can talk to. Find things that you enjoy. Definitely have fun. That would definitely be one. Find things that you enjoy and have some fun. Um, and I think be brave. Like try new things. I have a colleague who says try, fail fast, learn, try again. You know, he's, he's all about just give it a go, see what happens. You'll always learn something, whether it goes well or if it doesn't go so well, you'll learn and you can apply that later. So those are a few things that come, come to mind. And yeah. one quote actually that I read recently was be curious and kind. And that's be curious about yourself and how you are and about the world and be kind to yourself and to others. And I really like that. It's just simple and short. Be curious and kind. It's really nice, isn't it? And actually, Elved's just posted a question about um, music and how music makes you feel or, you know, and he was saying there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that movement and playing and just being in that space is good for your mental health. Is there a lot of scientific proof out now which we can tell yeah. the children? Absolutely. I'm not sure to be honest I'm trying to think of things that I've read like occasionally because of this, some of the things I follow you see headlines for the papers coming through so maybe I'll have a look and send you some through if I if I can find some that are relevant but I think as, as you say even anecdotally we know that it can help us feel better it can help us feel connected I know there are studies of particularly around singing and singing in choir yeah and the mental benefits for that kind of well-being benefits i should say for that so that is definitely one but i think for playing as well um it, there there are or they will be, so be. I I so. I those endorphins we we i read a, i read a study over in la yeah. that um people who sing in choirs have a something to do with cannabinoids have an extra 30 percent release of cannabinoids which is the same sort of thing that smoking um a certain intoxicating subject might give you 
so um, I, I wouldn't know because I've never tried it and I don't do that. Yeah. So I'm just singing lots of choirs. But you know, for those people who are interested, the reason choirs are so positive is it because it just it unleashes that chemical in your brain that makes you feel good. So we try and make sure all of our kids, um, when they're playing, they also sing as well, which is really cool. Um, let's, um, let's go through some favourite memories of music and bands. So I was talking to Stu <laughs> about um, what we like in our band. And I, my best memory of you, my absolute highest memory of you, was in your fourth year recital when you were at Birmingham and you played that ridiculous soprano sax piece called Cuckoo. And there was something like 50 pages on 20 music stands spread out across the concert room. And it was a solo soprano sax piece which involved multiphonics, some sounds which sounded like dying whales. I've, I mean, generally I've never heard anything like it before. Have you got sort of nice memories of music or things that we've done before? I was thinking about this yesterday when you said over the notes and I was thinking, I was thinking back to how many gigs I must have done with you guys over the years. So, so many. I was thinking about going to IAGE and seeing all of the amazing people there and us playing as well. And then, yeah, I think, you know what, so, so, man, so many of my good memories are about the people and the trips and the tours and, and being on coaches. I remember, I think this might have been an Emmy Joe one where we were in Germany. I remember singing We Are The Champions really loudly on a bus after a gig. I can't remember what trip that was. Um, I also remember being in New York and, and ice skate. Jane was teaching me to how to ice skate, which was going really well until Ed, who also couldn't ice skate, came <laughs> flying towards me. And it was one of those moments where we just, we knew we were going to crash. Neither of us could do anything about it. We just smashed into each other. So I have, alongside all of the playing and, you know, meeting at weekends and doing car washes and things to raise money and alongside all the playing memories are also all those social memories and the you know friendships that I've made that have lasted for such a long time and I'm sure we'll just carry on actually but I think there's you you get you get both you get the musical stimulation and you do get a huge social network of support essentially not just from staff but also from your peers I think that's the key well, part, isn't well, it? That, so I think that's one of the unique things about being in an environment like that. You do, you get, yeah. Uh, honestly, Absolutely. I think the friendships that you make, it's more, more and more difficult for kids to make really strong relationships nowadays because it's all done online and all done on the phones. Whereas actually, you can't quite be having a band party and um, the staff not knowing anything about it and you guys getting up to crazy things or going on tour as uh, we will be doing next year when we go to the Olympics. So, um, you know, that's been super cool. Um, it's yeah. been really nice, Lauren. Thank you so much for sharing um, your evening with us. If there's any more questions, you feel free to send them through and I'll pass them over to Lauren so that she can respond back to you particularly if there's any people interested in music and psychology, and I know there are lots of you out there, it would be really nice for you to send those through. If somebody wanted to get into music psychology now, how do they go about that? Is there a route or a pathway? There are courses that do music psychology. Uh, I don't think there is one where I went, but I know Goldsmiths has one, and I think possibly Keele and Sheffield, I want to say. There are a few universities that do all offer and it tends to be a master's I think rather than an undergraduate but some of them may now be doing undergraduates but usually there are little pockets of, of places so I'll try and have a quick look and send you through the ones but I think it's Goldsmith has, a, it has always had a really strong department there and I think yeah there are a couple up closer to you guys. That's lovely. And if anybody's got any questions that they would like guidance with, you know, music and music psychology, I'm sure Lauren will um, give you a shout for those as well. Yeah. So um, just leaves me to say thanks very much for tuning in to Vox9. We really appreciate it. If anybody would like to help us continue to support kids, we do have a micro patron program and it'd be lovely if you could contact Anna in the office and become a member and a supporter. Otherwise, thank you very much, everybody, for signing in. We will see you in the next Vox Talk in a few minutes. Have a great week and be good. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.